next talk here. So um, our next speaker is um, a gentleman named Adam Hopkins. Um, he is, let's see if, I, okay, so he is a builder of web applications for 20 plus years. Uh, you have probably used his code because he's the maintainer of the async IO web server and framework known as SANIC, which uh, learning about that led me to look up a while back, look up where that term came from. I, I love it when they name a library after a meme. That just makes me really happy. Uh, he's a self-styled authentication nut. And he's going to be talking about, uh, as you can see from his slide there, uh, he's going to be talking about um, overcoming access control in web APIs and addressing security concerns using SANIC. So all of you API lovers are going to really enjoy this one. Uh, so everyone, please welcome Adam Hopkins. Hello, everyone. Um, OK, as I um, said, uh, my name is Adam Hopkins. Um, I am a senior software engineer with Packet Fabric. Uh, Packet Fabric is a network as a, as a service platform that uh, provides uh, cloud connectivity solutions um, and has recently been named one of the top 10 hot, hottest networking startups. Uh, as I also said, I'm one of the maintainers of the SANIC project um, and I'm going to be using that to kind of showcase my talk here, but it's not really a SANIC talk itself. Um, so, with that said, uh, we're going to be talking about security mainly, but we're not going to be talking everything. We're not going to talk about C TLS certificates, how you should maintain um, passwords and information, sensitive information, how you should store that, or how you should uh, keep your, your server secure, SQL injection, all that kind of stuff. i am be very happy to talk with you about, but we'll take that offline. Um, and, and what we really want to talk about is these two things. We want to talk about authentication and authorization. So what is authentication? We're, we're talking about, do I know who this person is that's trying to access my API? That's, that's the first step. That's this question here. That's, is the person logged in? If not, we're going to send them an unauthorized message. If they are, we're going to ask them a second question. We're going to ask whether or not should I let this person in? And the same thing. If not, we're going to throw them an error message. So real quick, that's basically what we're talking about here. So here is my endpoint. As you can see, we're going to serve up some really super top secret information. We don't want anybody to know this, that foo is bar. So we're going to try to protect this. And this is how we're going to do it inside of SANIC. Right now, if I were to hit that endpoint, it doesn't really do me any good because anybody that hits that endpoint is going to find out who is bar. So how are we going to protect that? SANIC is very similar to Flask in that it uses decorators uh, pretty heavily. So we're going to create ourselves this protected decorator. What does protected need to do? It needs to do protection. If we can get through this do protection and we're happy with what happens, then we'll go ahead and we'll execute our handler. If not, we're gonna, we're gonna bail out and we'll serve up our error. So, so we've got this, this uh, function up here and we're gonna try to figure out what that should do. Now, I just said that we're gonna do this using uh, decorators, but there's also a very other valid way to handle things. One of the things that Sanix sort of prides itself on is not being very opinionated and try to leave as many tools to the developer as possible because after all, this is, this is your application, this is your API. So a very other valid way to handle authentication would be to create this middleware and on every single uh, request before it even gets to the, to, to the handlers, we'll execute this middleware and do the exact same due protection method. Um, so this is certainly a valid option. So. This is probably the most important thing. If you walk away with nothing else from this conversation, remember authentication failure is a 401 and that's unauthorized. It's weird, I get it. It's sort of this legacy thing that's hang, a hangover from the early days when the World Wide Web is you know, still like the wild, wild west. Um, so authentication leads to unauthorized, an authorization failure is forbidden. So remember that. So SANIC is going to provide us with a very easy way to do both of these things. So we've got these two exceptions. We're going to run do, do protection. If we fail authentication, we raise unauthorized. 
if we pass and we fail authorization, then we go on to forbidden. Okay, so we know currently as we're set up, it works, it does what we want. So the question is, how are we going to determine authentication? And this is sort of the meat of, of the talk here. So inside of HTTP, there's a few different uh, common ways of handling authentication, but we're going to eliminate right off the bat three of these. Basic and digest, again, are sort of legacy. They have some security issues and they're not really um, meant for handling the type of APIs that we're healing you with. OAuth, great tool, probably a conversation uh, for its own 30 minute talk at another time. Um, so again, this is something we could talk about off, offline. A lot of the concepts that we're going to talk about here are going to be applicable, uh, but it's sort of a framework in its own right. Uh, what we're really talking about here are bearer tokens, and these are the things that go inside of your, your headers and session tokens. But I want you to forget that. Everything that you already know, you already have a preconceived notion of sessions, cookies, headers, take that and just put it aside for a minute because we're going to sort of build up our, our information knowledge again. Okay, so first we're going to talk about this sort of hypothetical that I have. We have we've got a train and our train offers two different types of tickets. You can have a session ticket or a non-session ticket. And something else that's gonna be peculiar about our train is every single time that our train stops at a station, our conductor is gonna check every single person's ticket to make sure that they're still valid. Okay, so how's this gonna work? In our session based, it's a single ride. You buy your ticket, you're gonna go from one place to another place, you're gonna get off and that's it. You can't use that ticket again, you can't, uh, you have to buy a new ticket if you want. And every single time that you get to a station, the conductor is going to take his tablet, he's going to look up your ticket number, he's going to say, yep, it's in our database. Yes, this is still valid. We haven't gotten to the endpoint. You can, you can stay on the train. Uh, we're going to contrast that with what, what I'm calling non-session tickets. You're, you're probably not going to see this language elsewhere, so don't go start Googling this because you're, you're not going to really see this. Um, this is sort of the all day pass. This is, I can get on and off as long as I want, as long as my ticket hasn't expired. And the, the really nice thing about this for the conductor is he's gonna, gonna look at your ticket and just by looking at the face of it, he knows whether or not he issued this. He knows that this is valid, it hasn't expired. He doesn't have to go looking up inside of a database or anything like that. So how do those session-based requests work? Our client is gonna initiate a login with some credentials to our server. Our server is gonna check them to make sure that they're okay. And it's gonna create this thing called a session and it's gonna store it somewhere. And it's gonna give a session ID back to our, to our client. And every single time that that client wants to, to make a new request, they're gonna use that session ID. We're gonna go look that up in the database and then we're gonna deliver the information. So this is a very tried and true method. Uh, you find this all over the web currently. So the next thing we've got is these non-session based. And this is where we supply our credentials. We're gonna generate some kind of a token. We don't need to store this somewhere. There's no data store. And every single time that token comes back, we can just look at it to know whether or not it's valid and whether or not we wanna provide the information. Okay, so let's take that information and hold on to it. We have sessions and non-sessions. Next thing we're gonna decide is what's our strategy gonna be? And we've got three questions here. Who is going to consume our API? Is it gonna be a script? Uh, is this going to be some sort of application? Is there's gonna be somebody inside of a curl uh, command? Who, do we have control over that client? And what, and will this be, will there be a web browser that's gonna be trying to get information from our API? And really what we're trying to get at is sort of that last question. Is this a direct access API? Is this a browser API? Or is it gonna be both? Um, why do we want to know that? Well, first of all, direct APIs are a lot easier to, to handle. Number one, we were dealing with usually a more uh, technically sophisticated user. It's usually going to be a programmer that's going to be going to be doing this. And we kind of assume that they're doing what they can to protect their, their, their tokens and their keys. Um, so this is sort of the, the typical scenario. Maybe you've used, um, you know, say um, one of these web-based email providers, you know, and you want to be able to send out an email, they're going to provide you a key, these login credentials, you're going to send a request, and you're going to send them that key, um, and, and you've got access to the API. 
Then on the other side, we've got the browser based. Now this is really sort of our problem. The browsers are sort of built not really to handle authentication the way that we need to do it these days. And because we have got less lesser technically sophisticated users who might have installed a bad plugin or um, maybe, maybe the websites itself got security flaws, we've got these two things called CSRF and XSS. Um, going into details about exactly what they are, let's do that in the conversation afterwards, but these are the two things that we're really trying to protect against. And these are the things that we're concerned with. And so, our, so we wanna figure out how do we solve for that? Okay, so the problems with browsers is, is these two questions here. How is the browser gonna store my cookie or my, my token? You know, is it gonna put it into a cookie? Um, it's gonna store it somewhere. Uh, these are different tools that are built into the JavaScript libraries. Um, and because they're built into JavaScript libraries, JavaScript can access them. If JavaScript can access them, then sort of the bad, the bad guys can get at them too. And that's, and that's really what the XSS attacks are that we're trying to, trying to figure out. Um, now, the other thing we have to talk about is how is, is our browser gonna send those cookies back to, our, back to us? Uh, we've got two options. We have cookies and we have authentication headers. Um, and so how is this sort of typically handled? How is, if you went to Google and, and try to figure out, figure this out, what are they probably going to recommend? Well, they're going to say, if you've got a session cookie, uh, session token, stick it in a cookie, you know, yeah, we got to deal with this thing called CSRF, but we're going to solve that with a header. Um, now inside, uh, I've put in a link in the in the discussion uh, forum to a repo, and inside there, uh, there's an example that goes into to how you can do this. Um, so let's again, let's let's talk about that kind of offline and look at look at that example, and uh, we can we can talk about CSR. But just know that we're going to solve for these session-based cookies um, by using some uh, authentication uh, head, uh, using an XSRF token header. Now. What you might find out there is people are going to say, well, you've got, you know, uh, a token like a JWT token. Well, how are you going to do that? You're going to send it over an authorization uh, bearer token. Problem with this is that we're still open to XSS attacks. So let's do a little recap. To answer the question of how do we authenticate, we need to answer, you know, know about session versus non-session. We need to know about direct APIs versus browser APIs. And we needed to know about different types of, of tokens we have here. Okay, so we know if we're gonna have a direct API, we can use an API key in the authorization header and we feel okay that that's gonna be safe. Or we can put a session ID inside of cookies in the browser and that's gonna be safe. But what about when our API has to do both? What if we need to serve both a direct API and a browser and we don't wanna have two different methodologies to sort of authenticate, how, how, how are we going to, to do this without overcomplicating our application? Second question is, what if we wanna use JWTs inside of our front end framework? How can we do that safely? Well, I'm gonna tell you that we can. All you need to do is you need to take, take the right pill here. So let's talk a little bit about what a JWT is. This is a mess of characters but we'll notice that there are periods inside of a JWT. And these periods break up the JWT into three different parts. I've color coded them here into blue and purple. And those represent three bits of information. The orange is our meta information. This tells us how we can read the rest of the token. The blue is sort of the, the money. This is, this is really where the value of JWTs come in because it allows us to take some actual usable information about, um, about who has logged in and actually serve that information back. And then lastly, we have the, the signature here. So is really that sort of uh, bit that allows us to take a look at this and know whether it's valid just on its face of whether or not uh, we, we can we can we can look at it because basically what's going to happen is we're going to take this whole thing and we're going to we're going to create the signature and it's going to be based off of a security um, um, 
you know, security secret that is going to only be known to our server. And so our server is the only one that's going to be able to generate this based off of the rest of this information. So how are we going to handle this? Well, what I'm going to suggest is let's create two cookies. We're going to have one cookie that's going to be called our access token. And that's just going to be the first two parts of our JWT. And then we're going to have the second part that is going to be what I call the access token signature. And that's just that third part. So we've broken up our JWT into different parts. And really the important thing to note here is this, this HTTP only. And this is a browser feature. All major browsers support this now, so we can rely upon it. And what that's gonna do is it is going to say, yes, I have a cookie, but this cookie can only go over HTTP requests. JavaScript cannot get at it. So that's great. Problem is if our entire cookie were, were, were HTTP only, then we can't get at this section here in, in blue that we do want our, you know, our, our front end application to be able to get at. So that's why we don't have HTTP only here and we do have it down here. So cookies, cookies seem like they're gonna do the job for us. So how can we handle this inside of our Python code? And this is, um, and so what we need to do is we're going to take our token and we're gonna split it based on that, on that period into two parts. We have the header and the payload, and we have the signature. And then all we're gonna do is we're gonna create cookies. We're gonna create an access token with our header and payload. And this is the important thing that I just mentioned, HTTP only is false. And then uh, our, our signature, and we're gonna put HTTP on, only on for that one. Now I've also put in the CSFR token here because this is typically, you're gonna to wanna to do it at the same time. Um, and again, this needs to be false here. And the reason why is the way that we get that CSFR security is we're going to, we want to be able to read that from our JavaScript and we want to be able to insert that into a, in a header when we make the request. And the reason why we're going to do that is because now we know that, um, it came from our JavaScript. Um, okay. So. This is sort of how you would set cookies inside of SANIC. It sort of acts and looks like a dictionary, but not really, because um, as you can see here, you know this value is just a is just a string. So it kind of looks like it, but just know it's it's something a little bit different. So we can we can say our cookie key equals value, and then set all this sort of meta information on it afterwards. So it looks like we we have a winner. We we solved the problem. We figured out how we can use a JWT. And the solution is with two cookies. We're gonna put, we're gonna store two cookies. We're gonna send two cookies. And then we've got this header for CSFR protection here. So we've, we've sort of solved both of these problems and we've got our nice little green check mark there. So what is this gonna look like inside of those handlers that we set up at the very beginning? Well, when we do execute is authenticated, we need to get that token. So how are we gonna do that? We're going to go back into our cookie again. It's, you know, um, actually at this point when, uh, when we're inside of a request, it actually is a dictionary. So, so we've got a, we've got, we've got our tokens that we can we can take here and we can rebuild them back into one single thing. So once we do that, we can try and decode it. Now this decode method is going to throw up all sorts of exceptions if that JWT is not valid. So all we need to do is just listen for the exceptions and return either true or false. So that's Pretty simple there. Okay, so this is back. This is that 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 thing that we're going to do inside of our uh, protection method. So we we just figured out how we can do is authenticated. The next question is, how are we going to do is authorized? So we've got our we've got our method here, and this is where I'm going to introduce something. Um, it's a little bit different. This is something that I call structured scopes. Now, uh, a couple years ago, when I was trying to build an API, I figured, okay, let's great, let's go and let's add some scoping. Uh, I wanna have certain users be able to hit this endpoint, but not this one. And how is this done? And I, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out exactly what's the standard out there. And I was really actually kind of disappointed to find out that there was no standard. So I went, you know, and try to figure out what's the best way that, that to, to do it. And I came up with this idea. Um, maybe one of these days, if I ever, you know, 
find the time to do it. Maybe I'll submit an RFC or something about it. But basically what we've got is uh, a string of characters and we're gonna separate it with these colons. The first one is our namespace and everything after that is gonna be an action. So we're gonna have two of these. Um, and we have, we have um, this is what we're gonna validate it against and this is what we've got and we've got a check mark. So this is sort of what it looks like. Our requirement says we have user read and uh, incoming we've got user read write and this is valid. So we're just gonna stick this inside of our, our handler. So now all we need to do is put this on our endpoint and we can just proceed on with JavaScript. We can, we can feel you know, comfortable that um, our cookies are gonna be sent back and forth, that's great. But is there a better way? And that's this package here that I, that I created. It's going to set up a lot of this stuff for you. So the important things that I wanna point out to you here is we're gonna be sending our tokens with cookies. We're gonna be splitting them up into two parts, but we're also gonna say cookie strict equals false. And this allows us to fall back to those authorization headers. So now our API is able to do both the direct API and the browser-based. Um, Sandy JWT, added these three, these three endpoints for us. So this is what our, what our whole application looks like currently with fairly minimal code. And that is sort of, uh, that, that's it. That's what I've got for now. Uh, any questions, I'd be happy to answer them here or uh, in, the, in the channel later. Adam, thank you so much for that uh, excellent talk. Um, okay, come on computer. <laughs> It's doing it to me again. Uh, moment. Oh, this is always embarrassing when I can't get things to work correctly. There we go. Yeah. Hey. All right. And I do, in fact, have a couple of questions here uh, for you. So um, uh, Goose asks, why do we not need to store a token for a non-session based ticket? Why do, it's not a question of do we need to, the, 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 it's, it's we're trying to figure out if there's a, a way that we can avoid having to have session tokens. So in one side of the, one world, we need to check sessions and in another world we don't. One of, the, one of the sort of advantages of not having it is we just took away uh, a round trip call to make to our database. So with, with session tokens, you've got this extra request that you have to make on every single request. Uh, to the database and doing that, you know, adds more network time. So that's going to inherently slow down your application. So one thing that you do gain by this is, um, is by reducing, reducing that and you can, you can make your application a little bit faster. Okay. Uh, Cesar asks, uh, he's a sorry, is it working with HTTP two or HTTP three, or is it not dependent on that? Um, it's somewhat a little bit, it's a little bit HTTP one 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 two three. It's sort of a little bit of a different conversation. That's going to be more at the server level. Um, so you can you can run Sanic over uh, HTTP two, uh, but it would it would handle this stuff pretty much the exact same way. The one thing to know about HTTP two um, is you're sort of forced into using TLS certificates, which is a good thing um, because that's going to have, obviously add some additional security layers for you encryption all right uh, once again thank you very much for that, uh, Absolutely.